Hello my friends, I hope you had a fantastic day, evening or night, wherever you are. This week I'm back with a brand new podcast episode. I'm going to be interviewing Sam. Now Sam is a business coach and consultant. We're going to be talking about how you can create demand regardless of what the economy does, why marketing is important. Is AI a big threat or not? Is the world going to end because chat GBT is a thing and AI editing is a thing? Find out in this episode. I'm going to hand over to Pass Me to conduct this interview and I'll see you in just a moment's time. Hi everyone, I'm Sam Sharma and I am a business coach and a consultant and I specialize in working with small business owners, whether they are starting up or they are looking to grow their businesses, overcome the three biggest problems that a lot of them face out there. One, they're getting the loves and the likes, but they're not really making any money. So they are all busy on social media, but they're not really getting any traction. Second, they might be getting some traction, but they're kind of stuck at a certain ceiling. They've not really broken through. If they look at the last 24 years, they're stuck at certain income levels, right? And the, th- and the third part is uh, they are actually not having enough conversations with the right people. Or even if they do conversations with the right people, their perceived value is so low that people are not really seeing them worth working with. So those are the kind of challenges I work around. Uh, I've been in the, in the game for over 12 years now worked with over 200 different business owners, uh, written a couple of books. So yeah, been a busy, busy time. (laughs) Thanks so much for the time, Sam. I appreciate it. And, you know, there's a lot going on right now, I think would be fair to say. You know, there's a lot of stress, a lot of worry, a lot of concern around, okay, what's happening with the economy? Okay, what's happening with this? What's happening with that? And where I wanted to start today's show with is how do we cut through that noise? Because there's a lot, there's a lot that's trying to distract us. There's a lot that's like, hey, look, there's a fire over here. Look, there's a fire over there. Look, there's this thing, there's this thing, there's this, 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 this. whether this is news, whether this is social media, whether this is etc. I mean, how would you, because I think one of the main things for me I found in the last couple of years is my inherent focus on what I've got to do and how I do it is being allowed me to really cut through what's possible and allow me to really cut through that noise. And I know it's something that you also help your clients with and help you know them articulate and, and, and really get through. But for those who are really, really struggling with it or really new to it, how would you sort of help them navigate this really noisy market? Yeah, so there are two elements in this. The first element is the economy element, you know. So there's something happening out there in the global economy and all that. Yeah, there was so much money paid out during COVID times. Money has to be taken back. So... First part is to understand these economic cycles, they just go up and down. So that's the bigger picture. The smaller picture is your personal economy. Now your personal economy may not be impacted as much as the noise out there in the bigger market. I've been through, uh, you know, through some of the major recessions, you know, in the banking world and everything. And I was in the bank and I was thinking, what recession? The whole world is talking about recession in 2008. But there wasn't no recession for us. So understand the difference between macroeconomy and your little microeconomy. Your microeconomy might be completely intact, provided you're doing the right things in the business. What could that be? Well, firstly, you need to know if I work my way back from money. Let's say if our ultimate outcome on this planet is to make money from our business. Let's just get it right in perspective, right? So Money comes from where? Money comes from creating sales. Sales comes from doing marketing activities. Marketing activities comes from different social media platforms. They come from the right messaging. Uh, Messaging comes from the right offers you made and offers come from the problems you solve for the markets that you've identified. Right. So now if I start from the top, what problem have you solved for yourself that you can solve for others? If you've got that first part right, then you've got a place to go out there and help people just like yourself. Because chances are your clients are just your previous versions of yourself. So you understand them, you get them, and you're the best position to help them provided you've understood this about yourself. Does that make sense, Carl? Yeah, absolutely. No, I completely agree. And I think, you know, something that I work when I coach people or when we work on a video point of view is, okay, yes, you have lots of shiny credentials and yes, you have lots of shiny things you can do and et cetera, but... At a base level, who, what problem do you fix? That's it. We can we can make it look pretty, sound pretty, etc. But why do I need to care as a consumer? Right? Whether this is business to business or business to consumer, doesn't matter. Why do I need to care about actually giving you first level, first level attention? Why should I give you some attention? Why should I invest some time consuming or listening to you? Whether that's for a piece of content like this or 
on a call or in a networking room or etc what what value quote unquote what value what 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 tangible thing am i going to gain is it going to be a bit of inspiration is it going to be a bit of entertainment is it going to be a bit of education is it going to be a mix of the above right how are you going to be able to move that needle for whatever that yardstick is for you that's right that's right because Because if you can't do that if you can't do that you're just becoming more of the noise right that's it and ultimately this actually also reminds me of the two elements why people actually need someone else in their life the only reasons why we need is i have something i don't want and you will help me get rid of it or i don't have something you will help me acquire Right. Those are the only two reasons or one out of these two reasons why someone will have any support out there. So knowing what are you really? Are you there to take someone's pain away or are you there to give someone a desire that they can fulfill through you? That's the first place to start in whether you're a startup or you're growing your business. That's the part you need to polish, really. Mm. And I think it's about, you know, what point and what quote unquote credential it doesn't even have to be like i have the university degree but what track record do you have what evidence social proof reality do you have have you done and it doesn't necessarily mean you've had a million views for example it could be no i've done this a thousand times right so this is what i found in my thousand times of doing it right I'm trying to save you that time and energy and those resources in doing a video a thousand times because I found the best way to do it is this way, right? That's not the same as necessarily understanding the creative differences, sure, Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but from a technical point of view, this is how you look at doing it, right? There's a reason why these rules exist and there's a reason why every filmmaker and every photographer in the world is taught those rules. Mm. Do we break them sometimes? Yes, absolutely. But you have to understand why the rules exist so you can break them, right? In the same way with business, right? Yes, sometimes we're going to do things that are more out of the box, but you need to understand the psychology behind why we make purchasing decisions. You know, how do we optimize what we can do as well from a marketing comms point of view? How can we articulate the right messages to the right people at, at scale and at volume? Because the more people you touch, the more people you connect with, the more likelihood there's going to be for you yeah. to hit the right person at the right time, right? Yeah. And a lot of people don't even get started because in their heads they're thinking, well, it's so out of my depth that I don't have confidence. And this is what we need to think about that, you know, your confidence comes from your competence. Your competence comes from your experience. Your experience comes from practice. So if you get into the habit of practice of doing things, you will build that confidence in time, whether in any media or any way you want to express or articulate who you are and what value you offer. Mm. I mean, that does open up an interesting question that I did want to ask you, though, because I think sometimes we get, especially as starting up businesses or people in general, I think we misunderstand, I'm, I'm privy to it, I'm sure you are as well, what role media actually plays, right, as a whole, right? This could be TV, this could be social media, this could be newspaper, this could etc. So from your point of view, what would you say the role of media's job is? Because mm. media media has changed and developed like everything, but it's been around for, it's one of the oldest, in, we've had a way to communicate, there is yeah. a communication happened for as long as we've been able to, you know, for as long as we did cave paintings, right? So it's actually one of the oldest industries ever. Right? Has it changed and developed in the mediums in which we use? Sure. But the concept of communication mm-hmm. hasn't. Right? It's the oldest, it's one of the oldest that you can find, right? Mm-hmm. But what at fundamental, what role do you feel media's media's job is yeah. to do? I think it's all about creating a perceived value of you in front of your audiences. So for example, if I come across someone in a networking event. There's only limited time for them to know me. But if I pass the Google test or if I'm on YouTube, if I'm in all the media channels or as many as marketing channels, it lifts my perceived value in the eyes of my prospect. And one of the places where I found in my experience where it really makes an impact is when you tell someone about your pricing. If they've checked you out and stuff like that, and when you say you cost this much to work with, sometimes it's not a shock for people because they're like, Mm, you know what? It makes sense because this is a key person of influence. They've done all these things. They've achieved all these things. Yeah, it makes sense for why they are priced at that point. You know, this is the same basis for identifying, oh, wow, he's cheap. What makes him so cheap? 
right? It's the same basis. It's so from my point of view, the role that media is playing is, yeah, besides the uh, obvious, which is getting you out there in front of the media and people and all those things. The real role is about perception. It's what what is you are being perceived as out there and media has got a massive role in that. That's my opinion. No, no, I completely agree. And I think it's really important. And, you know, we talk about this a lot about what role content plays and et cetera, and why people should do talks and et cetera, and all these things and why people should have a book and, you know, et cetera. But what it does is it adds that level of you are the expert within your field, right? Now, sometimes when you say that, people get it wrong. They think they're saying, I am the only expert that there is and I know everything there is to know. It's not what we're saying. What we're saying is, I am the expert in comparison to who I work with, right? in comparison to the who the clients I'm trying to support and lead and help, right? That's the yardstick we're using, not we are the greatest of the great of the great, because I don't believe you can be, right? And if the last couple of years has shown me personally anything, is actually, no, every day is a school day, and actually every day you need to learn and develop and, you know, find new ways to to leverage things or to create things or reality, and I'm sure we'll get on to some of those things, uh, you know, shortly. But initially... Where does someone, because I, 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 pricing is this like really big stumbling block for a lot of people, mm. right? Whether that's, don't know where I sit, don't know what I should be pricing as, okay. and or actually I need to up my prices, but I'm terrified I'm going to lose all my clients. Yeah. How, what, how do we do pricing? How does pricing work? So, how, what, what, how does that work? Yeah. So few, there are, there are tons of models out there, but some of the ones that I kind of love is firstly, you got to understand, you got to provide for your own needs because if you don't have the oxygen mask on yourself, you can't save others out there. So what will it take you to put that oxygen mask on yourself is to know your own numbers. And remember, if your numbers don't show it, you don't really know it. So you got to be able to identify what is it that a number I want to hit. Work your way back from there to understand at what rate can I sell some product or service that allows me to meet that number, whether it's one time, whether it's 10 times, I don't know. So that's the first part to understand a number. Come up with a number. Okay, I would love to hit 5K a month, 3K a month. Now, once you've understood that, this is this is nothing but your, um, what I call it as the, the, the lowest monthly, like the basics expense. You need the minimum survival budget to be bread line, right? The second thing I want you to understand is What's been your best month ever in business? Think of that line for a minute. What could be that number? That's your best month ever you had. You're like, okay, so that was like, if my minimum budget is like, say, minimum survival budget is thousand pounds, my best month ever was 3000 pounds. Awesome. Okay, what would be the dream month for you in business? How will it look like? What you, you might say 10,000 pounds, right? That would be amazing, right? So here's what happens in your mind. You are living your life in paradigms. So which means if you're living from a paradigm of minimum survival budget, that's all about what you're trying to hit and you're satisfied with. But imagine if your best month ever becomes your minimum survival budget, you're already moved along. So my question to you is, if your best month ever is your minimum survival budget, would you be showing up in the same way you're turning up now to hit your minimum survival budget? Would you be acting, behaving, speaking in the same way that you are doing right now? Because as the price goes up, so is the value of the product people are getting back. So they expect for you, them to be walking into a brand and be looked after in a certain way. And all of this thing amounts to your own way you're attracting, where you're converting, where you're delivering. It's tons of value. So there's one element there. The other smallest example that I use for your the the money or the pricing sort of things is uh, if I wake you up in the middle of the night and I say, well, I've got a 10 pound an hour job. Come on, get up 10 pound an hour. Go and get it. Would you get up for that? And I do this exercise at 10 pound, 20, 30, 50, 60, 70. At some point you will be like, yeah, I will get up at that much money in the middle of the night. Straight away, that's given us your internal value of where do you measure your, your life, your, your sleep, against the amount of money you're willing to get up for. It could be 100, it could be 1,000, I don't know. But at least it gives you the second level of an indicator within yourself that is defining the pricing points. And the third part of the puzzle is the market. You've got to look at what's happening in the market. How much are my competitors charging at what price points? 
And am I being different? Am I so different that I can get away with charging more? Or am I trying to compete or fish in the same pond as others? Yeah. And I, th- yeah. I mean, to an extent as well, though, it does come from are you creating your own demand or are you just serving the market demand? Right. Because if you're serving the market demand, you actually do need to, this is going to sound horrible, you actually do need to care about what's going on in the market. If you're creating the demand for yourself, hmm. you don't really. Yes, you should look at the market. I'm not saying ignore it. I'm saying be aware of what's happening, be aware of the conditions. Yeah. But also you care less because you're creating the demand for yourself. And I think this is where the collaboration mindset really comes from because you know you're going to create and you're going to synergize and you're going to talk to the right people at the right time for them to potentially work with you. And for them, you will be the only option. And this is, to an extent, what we look at in networking when we look at competition lockouts. Because for me, I've never been someone who's like, you know, if there's another video person in the room, that's cool. I'm sure they're incredible. Mm. I'm incredible too, right? But I might be incredible for Sam, but for Sally, nah, nah, sorry, Colin, doesn't work with me. But Mm. the other video person might be completely perfect for Sally, right? And Sally and that person might work well, incredibly well, and then me and Sam might work incredibly well. Mm -hmm. Okay, great, so we're both winning. So that's creating demand, that's undergenerating synergy. And I think so many people, they have this scarcity or this worry, especially when the economy gets difficult or the economy gets difficult, you know, things are harder, the phone isn't ringing as much, etc. Where they think just because that person is winning, Mm. I can't or I'm not going to, right? And something I always try to ground myself in when I notice that I'm slipping down that rabbit hole is how many years have they been in business? How many years have they been around? What is their age difference? What is their skill difference? And all these things that I try and validate because then it, then it's like, actually, is that a fair comparison? Mm. In most cases, you'll find very quickly, no, it isn't. Yeah. The only fair comparison is where were you 6, 12, 18 months ago? And then where are you trying to aim or where you're going to be in 6 or 12 months time? Yeah. Because that's a fair comparison. Because you're the person who had the same challenges, same issues, same money, same concern, same equipment, same area, same environment, etc. Right? But have you increased what you're doing? Yeah, definitely. I will, I, and I will add to that when you talked about collaboration part. I think there is only so much so that you get away with on your own. You reach a certain stage after a while where you're like, it's only through connections, collaborations, and networking and meeting the right people will put you in front of the right people who will take you to the next level up. And that's the part a lot of people like, like in my world, for example, I am a business coach, but my methodology has evolved over time when I saw what was in the market, what was missing, and am I owning up to all the sides of myself? So what are the sides of myself? Psychology, strategy, and technology. As a business owner, I know I needed all these three to rise up in my game. Now, there are other coaches or other business leaders out there who will focus on maybe one or the two pillars, not all the three pillars, right? Some of them won't even connect these. Things. Some people dealing with strategies don't even know or understand technology, let alone psychology part. Mindset areas, people don't step into strategies or technology, right? So you, you've got first part is to pull out your head and look at the overall picture. Look at the roadmap of where you are and where you're heading. Unless that road is clear to you or you know, okay, I'm in the right direction. This is where I want to be. You will kind of go along trying different things and not getting anywhere. Getting overwhelmed is where people get to when they don't know where they're going. Right? So collaboration, I think it allows you to see beyond those points where you've kind of reached your own limit. Like, okay, I don't know how to get past this, this upper ceiling now. What after that? And I think it comes back to the speed in which you want to grow as well, right? Like if you want to, quote unquote, cut the corners because you can go to someone who's already done it, they know what not to do, right? Mm. And this is what I'm saying about you are the expert in comparison to who you help, right? In the same way, I will have a coach, a mentor who's ahead of me in comparison to where I am. But they will potentially, hopefully, have someone who's ahead of them, Correct. right and this and and so on right so as long as you're adding value or helping people that Absolutely. are a step behind you two steps behind you three steps behind you then you can yeah. be the expert to them 
Right? This is such a good point. Such a good point to look for people who are only few steps ahead of you rather than like I get that a lot. You've got uh, people reading people. Oh, I've done how to make how to make eight figure business, seven figure business. You are not even making five figure business. Why are you reading those books? Because the mm. people who've written those books were not applying the strategies written in those books when they were at five figure level. That's where it becomes so, so important to understand two things. One, who are you as a person, as your personality? Second, what level of business are you at? Because it's in these two correlations that we pick up the right strategies, which are aligned with your personalities. Second, it's aligned to the place where your business is at. Mm -hmm. So when you look for people way out there, yeah, pick up the mindset because mindset's awesome. But strategies specifically, you just need people from who are few steps ahead of you because we still know what it takes to be at that stage. Like it takes us now, I call it a speed of anticipation where you can spot the problem when someone places an offer in front of you, like uh, I can see because I was just there a few years ago. Mm -hmm. and you're in the just, same, uh, yeah, yeah, the same way with marketing. You, I can't, you can't do what Coca-Cola do. Mm. We don't have the 15, 20,000 crown a month to burn, quote unquote burn. It's not burning, it's investing, but burn on ad spend we don't right yeah, yeah. and they'll double that or triple that if you're at christmas and they're putting lorries around the uk which is an entire separate conversation but it works and it's worked for them for a very long time but you know this is leaning into those pillars psychology strategy yeah. and technology and we'll get on to the we'll get on to those in more specific detail in a moment but i think for me it's about understanding as you say where you are and then what's possible with your resources because i think sometimes we can sit and say oh what's the new shiny thing tiktok trends are a key example yeah. trends in general are a key mm -hmm. example mm -hmm. should you trend jack should you okay what is the trend yeah. can you make it relevant to your to an audience that potentially is going to actually care about the rest of your content yeah if it's not don't waste your time that's it to be honest don't yeah. but Something I did want to ask you, because there's been this big conversation, especially lately in my industry and in my world about chat AI, video editors that are AI generated, you know, we use them, complete transparency, we use them, it's a good idea in my opinion, but I'm also very aware of why I'm using them and very aware of the asterisks around those, right? And I'll explain those in due course. But the, the, the thing is though, there's be also been this pushback of like what I would call traditional video production companies or traditional tech people, mm. which is really ironic to say because they're tech people, but are pushing back against it. And we really saw it in the copywriting world with the rise of ChatGBT. Yeah. There was a lot of copywriters who were going, well, that's it, we're done. That, that's it, game over. We're out of business. And I was like, surely you should be looking to leverage this to make what you do better. Mm. Not just going, oh, I'm done, GG, have fun. Right. I mean, what, what, how are you using AI? Like, where, where do you? Yeah. What's your What's yeah. your take on AI? Because yeah. I I see it as a really exciting time. Yes, there's concerns. Yes, there's issues. Like anything. Yeah. But actually, I think it it removes a lot of the really boring grunt work from a lot of business owners who, let's be honest, can be spending their time more effectively and are a lot better than just having to do that. Yeah. So the, to answer your question on ChatGPT, I or or any of these AI tools. Here's my take on it. There are a few things you touched upon here. Firstly, there is a good and a bad and all the layers in between in any professional industry. Yeah. So all these writers who are really good at what they do, AI will only enhance them. But if you are not that good, just because you had the gift of the gab, it doesn't make you good with everything out there. You know, especially if you don't understand the strategy, you may be really good with words, but you don't understand the strategy. So you're going to disappear for sure. Right. Because the good ones will take over your market share. It's a simple thing. We all have pond in front of us and we're fishing in the pond. But someone who's really, really good leverages AI to increase the size of the rod and they can fish in your pond and take them out as well. Right. So all you will see is you will see your pond drying up much faster here. This is why we say psychology. We understand strategies we apply technology we leverage we use the technology to get us that edge now in my business i experimented this myself uh, for example when i had to come up with titles i will come up with a title i will say suggest five different topics titles based on this topic on my video so it will come up with names that there is no way on earth i would have thought and i experimented that the number of views 
10 times when I picked up the AI title because they nailed that emotional part that I couldn't on my own. So I won't be hard on myself because A, I know I'm a content creator. I know what I was doing. I know what I'm talking about and articulating, but I may not be coming as smartly as AI just did on the titles or the, of the topics that I'm talking about. So, and you can rinse and repeat. So if you build a system with any content management, you can take that same piece of content and repurpose the content with another title name somewhere else, right? So there's no end to this. That's the first part. The second part is you've got, uh, You've got to understand what is AI. AI doesn't memorize this stuff from internet. AI learns to journalize stuff on the internet. So there is no way on earth my singular brain will be able to compete against millions of years of brains put together and journalizing that information. What it does though, yes, it really journalizes. What it means, it, it becomes commodity. When anything is commodity type, like it's it's not, it's available to everyone, it loses the spark, which means if you're a thought leader or if you are someone who is actually movers and shakers, you need to go beyond that AI level. Because people need to know that I can't use AI, I can't replicate Sam on AI at the moment. Even if they, let's say, if they pick up all my books and they feed it into AI, and here you go, Sambot comes out with, because Sambot has got all the knowledge, what's in the books, and they have journalized it to come up with all this, right? That's what the bots will do eventually, right? But here's the problem with that. The bot doesn't understand that the client I'm dealing with has got cancer and she needs help step by step. I need to give her slowly and I need to rinse and repeat and work with her through this. Bot doesn't know that. So sooner or later, as, as it's become more commoditized uh, AI market, everything people will start to see others post and see, well, that's AI post, I can tell, right? And it will lose the spark. It will lose the passion. And the only thing that remains out there will be the people who were authentically putting themselves out there saying, you know what? I own who I am and, and that's who I am. That's how I express myself. If I see it, I say it. I don't need to make it so polished. If English is not my first language, how come my posts are showing such sophisticated words? Well, clearly there's something happening there, right? So you've got to really understand. To understand the market, you must be genuine and authentic. And the best part is marketing is more about repelling the wrong people than about attracting. Because you need to attract people just that fits in your tribe. And mm -hmm. the thing is as well, the thing I was going to mention there is, there's a lot of different approaches you can use chat AI for. There's a lot of different things you can use it for, etc. And it's a example of an AI tool. You can replace the words chat AI and, 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 yeah, yeah. and insert any other AI yeah. tool you can think of, right? Yeah. Fantastic. But is there a strategic, moving back to the psychology, the strategy, and mm -hmm. then the technology, is there a strategic reason why you're using the AI tool, right? So for me, for example, it's allowed me to create more content, yeah. as in distribute more content, at a, a more value-centered level, as mm. in what I articulate in a video, which yeah. is the important element for me, it's less about what's written, to be honest, because I'm a video marketing company, which sure. means we care about video more than necessarily anything else. Mm -hmm. That's allowed me to articulate that better and more effectively and more of the time because I'm leveraging technology yeah. instead of what I was doing previously. Correct. Right? And that alone is the strategic decision I've made. That doesn't mean I'm going to stay with it. It's a test to see what happens. And what I think was going to happen is there's going to be a lot of people who are going to go, nope, not doing it, not doing it, not doing it. But they're going to fall into that category of they might lose significant and they'll be forced into it, mm. right? Mm. I didn't live through the rise of the internet, but from those who I've spoken to who did, this is exactly what happened with the internet. People were going, no, I don't want to use it. No, I don't want to use it. No, I don't. Oh, fine, right? And this is what I would say to someone who's listening, who's thinking about using AI or not using AI. AI is here to stay, period. Yeah. Yeah. Whether you like it, dislike it, think it's rubbish, think it's amazing, think yeah. it's wonderful, think the world's over because we're using it. Sorry, the reality of the fact is, this is as of today at the time of watching yeah. and the time of recording and the time of you're listening to it, this is the worst AI is ever going to be. Full stop, that's it. It's only going to get better because of the way it's designed, because of how it works, and so on and so on and so on. And I also don't believe that the world's over. There's concerns, there's issues. Yes, we humans will fix it eventually. That's what we yeah. do, right? Yeah. Is my view. Anyway, the actual thing that people don't appreciate is time is our most valuable resource. And if you can leverage technology 
to mean that you can do more in the same amount of time, I will always outperform someone who isn't doing that. Mm. If you really want to just get transactional about it, I always will, right? Now, there's lots of conversations around should you and so on, but that's very specific to the business and how you leverage it. Mm -hmm. But for me, I think at the end of the day, and something that we're going to really start seeing as the concept of creating content gets monopolized by mm -hmm. computers, yeah. what you end up articulating and how you end up articulating it in that window of time is going to be the metric that matters. Correct. Because the concept of I can do a showy video that doesn't mean anything anymore. Yeah. I'm sorry, it doesn't. Phones are going to get to the point where you cannot tell whether this is a two thousand, three thousand pound camera or a phone. Yeah. We're not there yet. Give it five, six years with AI and software. We might be in it, especially yeah. if you well light it. <laughs> yeah. You know, you're going to have that balance in that. But I guess, what would you say to people who are still pushing against change and pushing against... Because we're back at the base level of psychology here, right? There's a reason why we, we put those in that order, right? But how do how would you work with someone who's really against AI and the concept of change and the concept of... Because that's yeah. actually a mindset issue, right? That's not yeah, even yeah, a strategy issue. The first thing I will say to you is that AI is a tool. It's not a strategy, okay? It could, it could be replaced by quantum, which is coming after AI. So quantum computing is going to blow AI to another level altogether. And if you're scared of AI, you know, you don't stand a chance at quantum level. So, so the first part is blind is leading the blind. What does that mean? It means when people don't understand technology, they scare others about technology. And as a consequence of that, they feed one another's fears into making it into something of a bigger of a deal. Yeah, the truth always is always there that there are always bad players somewhere in the world doing the wrong things, irrespective of what technology is in front of them, right? Because it's the technology, just like money, is simply a means. It reveals and makes you more of who you already are. So, you know, you're going to do what whatever is inside of you at the end of the day. From a business point of view, our objective is what? Our objective is to create a living, a good living out of doing something we are passionate about which allows to help others and help others become a better versions or whoever they want to be or whatever they want to do. That's the ultimate reason why we came into business. We came into business to achieve the number one thing, which is freedom. Now, this is part which is what you touched upon. How will freedom come? Freedom comes when you create time for yourself. And time is the only asset we have that is depreciating for all of us. AI is designed specifically from a most people's perspective. It's a tool that allows you to buy time back in your life, attain that freedom part. As long as you know how to use it, what to use it for, you're simply creating value there, right? It's, it's, it's about tr learning how to train AI first to give you the outputs you're looking for. If you don't understand AI, of course, you will feel the fear because you're looking at all the negative. Negative news always sells, right? Scary things always sell. So to get attention, they put the scary stuff out there. And as a consequence, all of this happens, right? Like we constantly seem to be towards the end of the world every five days, even though, funnily enough, we've still been here. <laughs> yeah. I mean, what will happen will happen anyway. But like if I look at my dad and stuff who are learning new things at 88, you think like he doesn't need to. What? who is he doing it for? Well, he's doing it for himself. Because uh, it's it's an evolution process that he's taking it, you know, with him. He's he just wants to earn more. So, in a business point of view, our our fundamental job becomes to get our voice out there. Oh, you're talking about evolution. I think it's an important point though, because so many so many people don't want to evolve. Something that I've noticed, right, is is we get into this kind of traditional sense or traditional world of simply simply talking about uh, that how how these different things if you look at the human evolution it's all about learning something and passing it on to the next generation and that's how we have survived all these years because we passed on we taught someone else and we we went on to the next journey right and isn't that what we are doing right now even we are building something passing it on to someone else and if the question is, how do we make it more and more authentic? And the only way to do that is by putting yourself out there through video. Because video can't be, at the moment, it can't be emulated from a chat GPT perspective. It can't. 
you know, unless you become a robotic version of yourself. <laughs> but even then, I think you would lose the, I would argue you would lose the emotion, you would use the, you know, the things that, how, like, why do we make personal decisions? Why do we trust in the way we do? Because of that human connection element, right? Now, yeah. in the marketing space, we talk a lot about, you know, data, we talk about ads, we talk about content, we talk yeah. about marketing, we talk about delivery, all these things. But at the end of the day, who's the person going to one make the purchasing decision and two going to actually have the content reach them whichever distribution channel you're using right people buy a, from people, a, hum yeah. a human right at the end of the day the, the bottom end of the chain is a human talking to another human yeah that's it people buy from people they like it's very simple as that you know and and of course there are a lot of intricacies but most of people get confused in the tools they think they need to use the next strategy out there rather than fixing who they are for example right it's not what we do it's who we are i was working with a dating coach it's a really funny story i was working with a dating coach and he was a man in his 50s nothing wrong with that but he was making friends with with girls who were at 18 19 20 teaching them how to get a man now that could be really hard because a is putting them themselves out there with the wrong messaging haven't haven't done any work like that before and the girls are perceiving him completely incorrectly even though he's got the good intentions behind so you've got you've got always a level of awareness that the person is missing about where they are but when we work with them and i tweaked him to go and help divorcees who are in their 40s suddenly his market just clicked because people in their in their as they come to the middle middle life crisis and all those kind of things, they are out of the dating game for so long they don't even know how to go back into that scene. So when we we repositioned him and went after in people in forties, he started getting traction and conversations out of people. Yeah, I mean, that, I guess that opens up a question in any business though, not just dating, regarding how do you do the the positioning or how do you do the the reality yeah. where you know you find your you find yourself you know how do you position so to speak right mm -hmm. because it's very easy for us to sit here and say we're both positioned in the way we are and we're in that position where we know what who we're talking to we know the market etc mm -hmm. but how did you come to, to how did either help your clients or how did you come to your that reality for your for your clients because it's not a simple thing to just do right no no you don't, no. You, you, well, you don't just magic you know with yeah. there yeah yeah I, th I think it's a journey of self-awareness uh at with sir in certain aspect when i started my journey i didn't know who i will help i simply knew well i've written a book on the money life coach which was all about understanding money debt and emotions you know and how this plays in your life and how you need to get that right in order to build any kind of prosperity now that book was aiming at everyone i didn't even think what it was it was simply a monologue of this is what i did right and but when i dig deeper i started to understand it connects more with the final year students who are coming out of universities with tons of debt starting their life on back foot so that became a market but that happened over time and as i as i went into the networking scene met more and more other business owners it became more and more and more clearer to me well actually there is whole host of things going on here so while i'm helping them with money it's actually not money it's something else it's not performance it's something else so as these pillars come together it was logical conclusion that well, actually it's psychology strategy and technology which they are either stuck at one of the three areas or they need help in so obstacles and opportunities both are coming from these three pillars which are interconnected with one another that was the ultimate conclusion right so it was like I started quite broad and as time went on, I started to attract specific kind of people towards me. But also, you, I guess you find, I mean, from my own my own personal experience, you find the people you are going to work with and aren't going to work with from a personality type point of view. You're like, mm, don't like you for whatever reason. Right? There's something against them personally. It's just this isn't going to work, right? And I think sometimes, you know, I was having a conversation with a coaching client uh, two weeks ago and we, she was talking about niching. I was like, hold on let's just just go back to base level for a second mm. at the moment you have no clients mm. right yeah. so why are you why are you niching yeah yeah right <laughs> what do you now, niche? Yeah. You're, you're what you're culling from no one yeah there so is, there's, 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 yeah there is a saying isn't it start 
broadly because your niche will come and find you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but th- that's out exactly of the point, right? You have to the the point of niching. Yes, you can charge more if you're a Pacific specialist in Pacific area yeah. serving a Pacific industry. Absolutely, yes, you can. Number one question: Do you want to do that? Mm. Right. Number one. Right. Number two: You can niche to a certain level, sure, but actually you're shrinking that pond every time, mm. right? So, it, how much is that pond worth? How much other competition is there in that pond? And or should you potentially and also do you want to as i said like personally for me i could i can tell you right now i could be making probably 10 times the amount of money if i just picked in an industry and became a specialist in it i don't want to do that because i don't i did i left a job for a reason which was i want my day to be very different every day and i want to have that you know difference in working in different industries hence why at the moment of the time of recording, I will not make the choice to go into a specific industry. Mm-hmm. But that's a choice because I value that aspect of my life more than any amount of money, right? I'm fully aware that I could be making more if I do so, yeah. right? But I don't want to because it's not in line with the value and the dream and the and the vision I'm trying to build, mm-hmm. which is the more important aspect for a lot of starting out business owners. It's are you trying to build, and this is what we alluded to earlier about, are you trying to build an eight, nine figure business? Or are you just trying to work four days a week so you can have the time with your kids and your family and that balance and you can have more work-life balance, right? Well, that's what they say, isn't it? Like you've got either tighten up on the niche or tighten up on the message. When you're building any kind of business, if you just tighten up any of these two screws, you will get the same traction. Either the problem that you're solving is so perfectly specific or the market that you're working for is so specific. Right? And a lot of people get caught up in the market aspect, not on the message aspect or the problem they're solving aspect. So, for example, in my world, it's about building a six-figure business because I know that the model delivers, provided you're consistently working on it. It's it's an iterative process. right? So the outcome is clear. Now, who is it best for? Where well, is best for any small business owner that wants to build a personal brand and it's not a performance-based business, but a lifestyle-based business. Right. So we need to really understand what's going on. And that comes over over years of experience that you see, OK, actually, A, you are helping these kind of people more. Second, you're getting results, better results with these people instead of the other kind, for example. So I think the market or as I said, the niche finds you as you keep putting your work out there. Yeah, no, so I also think there's an important point you mentioned there, which I want to mention, which is this belief system. Mm. Right. Because when the economy contracts, when there's a recession, when there's a depression, whatever, Mm. when there's things that aren't booming and things aren't because one of the issue my my generation has is we've only known a good market. Right. That's all we've known. So there's a lot of my generation going, this is terrifying because it's all we've known. We've only known good. We've only known easy money. We've only known easy, you know, to loan money, etc. Could it cost nothing, etc. But actually, if you believe in what you do wholeheartedly and you know that it worked previously, moving back to your conversation at the beginning about what's happening in the larger scale of the economy in relation to your own sector and your own little reality that you operate in, that we all operate in, right? Mm-hmm. We're not massive global corporations which deal with, you know, the, the problems Coca-Cola have to worry about are very different to the problem yeah. me and you have to worry about, right? Mm-hmm. And the crux there is actually what's worked for you previously and do you believe in what you're currently doing and does it synergize with, number one, what's going to make you passionate about talking about what you do, number one. Number two, does it generate you interest, value, etc., so that you're able to move that needle in whichever direction you need it to move, right? For some people, it'll be actually... I need to scale back some of the work that I'm taking on because I've got not the right clients, not the right niche clients, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, because I actually, um, all, and all my priorities are starting to shift because I've now got a family, right? Mm. And so on. And or I now need to actually increase my income because I've got a family, right? Is the other side of that, that coin as well, of course. But I think sometimes some people especially when we look at marketing because it's that consistency element and it it will work if you do it right and and, and etc we sometimes don't give it the time that we need to right now there's a difference between auditing and changing and developing and involving in what you're doing because the concept of doing the same thing expecting different results is the definition of insanity Mm -hmm. quote from albert einstein Mm. but 
that's not the same as saying I don't I'm not fully believing in this thing and I'm not willing to commit the concept is committing to what you're going to do and you know I, I alluded in our pre-conversation that I've pulled back from networking recently yeah. and that's not because networking isn't valuable it absolutely is there's two main reasons for that the first is is my target client the person I want to talk to at the rooms I was uh, able to gain access to not really lovely people they weren't really those people the right the right scale and size of business that i wanted to talk to fantastic and also number two i was trying to do a lot of things all simultaneously and doing them not great right yeah and that's sometimes i think the thing that people can get wrong and some people are concerned about and it's not about chasing perfection right it's about because done is better than perfect i do believe that but it's about actually having a real reality check with you and saying, okay, is this in line and is this actually moving me closer to that point B, whatever that point B might be for you? And is this going to continue to move me in that direction if I continue to do that? Mm-hmm. And, and I mean, do you find people sometimes because they fall, especially when economy gets difficult, they fall into the trap of, well, this has always worked and this is this is the way we've always done it kind of analysis. Yeah. So what I've found is people are at the moment, they say, oh, uh, um, it looks like I'm doing so much work, but nothing's coming out of it. Whereas in the past, lit- these little efforts would have resulted in something. That's one of the things you always hear. The other thing is that when people talk about when they want to know, because, you know, you 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 know how to unpack your intellectual property, you've actually shown them the value and they really see that, yeah, this is what I was looking for. I need help. I need your help. And at that stage, you tell them, okay, so how much is it to work with you? So you tell your price and they're like, oh, but I can't afford that. So so I tell them in that stage, okay, pick up that money and go and put it in the highest saving account. At best, at the moment with 7%, you will get what, 150, 200 pound back. But that money invested in yourself, year on year returns in thousands and 10 times more. So people, I think, I think they don't get that part right because they are too closely or too attached with what's happening right now in their life, and they're thinking they're I'm so buried doing all these things and nothing's getting, nothing's going anywhere. And they also sometimes don't see what's happening ahead. So, for example, September time, that's like the last push for this year, this quarter's goals. Yeah. So your message needs to change, your offers need to change. You need to come up with new things. If they don't, if they can't afford the big things, start with something small. You know, you can start them on a book, start them on a mastermind, start them on a on a group and, uh, you know, one to one can come later with you. So whatever it is, you need to pivot. If your market is drying out or something's not working, you need to pivot. You need to see what's working. Look at one person in your market who's who's got it, who's got it right. You can follow them and you can learn from these people. Like what are they doing differently right now? What was there was a lot of noise at the beginning of 2023 that coaching industry is changing, it's happening, this happening, that happening. So funny. Now I'm looking at all of the big brands out there reverting back to 2021 models. What's happened there? Because they were trying to run too fast with too many things and realizing well, actually people are getting disillusioned with all this new things coming out. Whereas our original models were working, so they're reverting back. Mm. And I think it's this concept to an extent where yes you need to pivot yes you need to change but actually it's about diversification right it's not necessarily sometimes saying no i'm not going to do this higher price ticket thing or this larger thing i'm going to have this thing but actually i'm very aware that i need to sell more of these smaller things to sustain that time window that takes me to sell the larger thing right so i'm less reliant on the larger thing and i think personally for me as someone who I would hope has diversified and, 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 you know, in the same as many business owners in the last couple of years has had to write, okay, this is what I'm facing, right? Okay, this is the reality we find ourselves. Okay, how do I navigate this? But now I have a very specific skill set that's like, okay, for this, and when I'm starting to do more prospecting, I'm like, okay, this person who I'm looking at their profile, their website, da, 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 where I'm doing that prospecting research, I'm going, this person could be a really good fit for this service that I offer. Not necessarily always trying to sell them on the top one. Actually saying, actually, this person is incredibly good as a coaching client. This person is incredibly good at the repurposing service. This person is incredibly good at the video production element. Whatever it may be, right? And the same with coaching, the same with uh, Mastermind and, and anything else that you offer as as a uh, service provider, right? 
But it's about really important to not try and sell the high ticket product to someone who isn't ready for that high ticket product and or you don't necessarily have the trust with you to build that Hmm. unless you're going for a cold strategy and that's a separate conversation entirely. You need to nourish them. You need to look after them and they are in your ecosystem. You need to show them like the product roadmap suite that we call. At, like if you look at people in shopping in Lidl's, Lidl's making profit, people shopping in Waitrose, Waitrose making profit. All these bands are making profits, but catering for different markets altogether. There are masses who can't afford your top end product. So give them something at that level. So you, they keep you ticking along. You know, Amazon still sends me 50 odd quid for this book I wrote 12 years ago. Still someone in the world buys it from somewhere and every month 50, 40 quid keeps coming in from the book sales. So it's like, it's one of those things. Uh, go on then, Carl. Yeah, no, no. I see. Uh, that's what I was going to mention is is about creating these, and I hate the term passive income because it's not passive, right? It's not. It can become a passive income, but yeah. at some point it had to be an active thing you built, Correct. right? A course, a book, a thing, a product, mm-hmm. etc. right? You had to build it at some point and you have to continually market and talk about it. Therefore, it ceases to be passive then, doesn't yes. it? Yes. Because you're actively having to continue to talk about it. That's correct. Right? Yeah. Or, and or pay into it being, you know, even if you don't technically do the marketing on it, you have to pay, Am- I imagine, I don't know, I don't have a book, but I imagine you have to pay Amazon a fee. They take that's, yeah, yeah. Yeah, Maybe. so they'll either take a cut on the sale or something. So again, it's still not passive because you're paying for some advertising to take place for that thing to be sold. Right. If it's truly passive, I can do nothing and money appears. I do nothing. I don't pay a cut. I don't do this. I don't do that. No, I do nothing mm-hmm. and I make money, which I don't believe happens because it's either someone else is doing it for you and they're taking a cut down the line and or you're paying them to do it and then the money comes to you passively yeah. or you've invested a huge amount of time, energy and resources to build a thing mm-hmm. That then you can sell passively, that's quote unquote. Yeah, yeah. Right? And I think that's a really important distinction because everyone, especially my generation, wants that passive revenue, right? Even stocks and shares that arguably could be passive revenue. It's not because you had to have the initial investment from Capital, someone. Yeah, yeah. So where did that money come from? Mm-hmm. Well, that was an active, that you either worked a job, you sold business, so on. You did something actively to make that money, right? That's right, yeah. And then you invest it in the market and then it gives you passive return. But again, you're still, again, still it's active based things. So I think it's about just understanding that, but also developing and diversifying what value you can add to the market and not sitting on your morals. I had a conversation this afternoon Mm. about this, which is like, I've been in business 10 years, so I'm entitled to be busy and I'm entitled to this. And like, you're not entitled to anything. Anything. Right. (laughs) Unfortunately, you're not. That's the reality of the world, right? You need to constantly develop, constantly change, constantly adapt. But also, the value you could add 10 years ago? Okay, great, fantastic. But what about the value you can add now? Because you should be better. Yeah. So in turn, actually, if your price has stayed the same, why has it? Right? Because it shouldn't. Because you're 10 years, 5 years, 2 years, 15 months, whatever, better than you were. Right? Just through sheer doing it. Right, and it's const- uh, again. This is with the asterisks in mind of saying you constantly evolve, you constantly change, you, yeah. you don't run from change, you don't. You know the concept. There's things that we're doing with AI. Okay, that's something that didn't exist 15 years ago. Yeah. Okay, so that's valuable now because mm-hmm. we're arguably one of the people who are willing to play around with it and say, well, this is what I'm finding. So that's the added value I add to my clients because I can tell them, hey, by the way, this thing works. This is how it works. Yeah. This is why it saves me time, energy, and resources. But I'm aware of I'm aware of time, aware of energy. So, thanks so much for the time, firstly. Awesome. But for those who want to connect with you, they want to get the book, they want to listen to coach your mastermind, etc. Where can they reach out? Where's best to talk to you? Well, my site is called sixfigureconsultancy.com. They can find me on LinkedIn or on Facebook, Sam Sharma, business coach. They'll find me there and uh, join my Facebook group. I think that will give you tons of value as well as the links for the books when it's released this month. Fantastic. And for those who are starting out in business, pivoting business, adapting, going with the way the, way the market's looking at right now, what piece of advice, if you were going to give advice, would you give them? I will say, uh, I would have said, uh, get someone ahead of you, get a mentor, don't do it on your own. But I will, I will say about time. 
i think i think they need to understand that they are uh, this opportunity is this time will never come again your holidays can wait whatever it is take it takes less than a year to get yourself on the feet sacrifice make the sacrifices now to have a future because uh, there are a lot of people their priorities are not in the right order and they tend to kind of have fun now you know so that i can build a business later or it will happen on its own it won't you'll have to make certain sacrifices now thank you so much just just come back and join me once again if you did enjoy this episode and would like to hear more about how video can help your business in 2023 though i'd love to hear from you i'll leave some links that may you may find useful in the description down below and i'll be back next week with a brand new interview to help you grow your business regardless of what the economy does and i'll see you very very soon